Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adam Goodhart, director of the CV Star Center for the Study of the American Experience, and um, I am delighted to welcome all of you this evening, and especially delighted to welcome our three amazing guests. Actually, four amazing guests, because we have one guest who I think is very much going to be here in the room with us, um, Alexander von Humboldt, um, who, although he's no longer with us, um, overshadows certainly the conversation that we'll be having and also as we will hear so much of um, contemporary life um, as well. Um, the Star Center, of course, when people ask us who we are and what we do, um, the word interdisciplinary often comes in pretty quickly in the conversation. We like to bring history into conversation with science, um, literature into conversation with art and politics. Um, and I think that uh, that's something that makes today's event especially exciting for me because Alexander von Humboldt really was, is one of the world's great interdisciplinarians, if that's a word. I'm not sure. Disciplinarian is a word, so interdisciplinarian, why not? Um, von Humboldt himself can't join us this evening, unfortunately, in person, but in his place we have three of the greatest living interdisciplinary polymaths I know um, sitting here in the, in the front row. Um, I will introduce them quickly and uh, then we will start the program. Our first guest, Andrea Wolf, is one of the most compelling contemporary writers on the history of science and also just um, an absolutely brilliant nonfiction writer across the board. Her latest book, the Invention of Nature, Alexander von Humboldt's New World, um, you've probably heard about if you've been um, tuned in or reading anything in the past few weeks, is getting lots and lots of attention. And she tells me, just made the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> and has been getting rave reviews everywhere. Andrea was born in India and moved to Germany as a child and now lives in Britain, where she trained as a design historian at the Royal College of Art. Um, her book, Founding Gardeners, The Revolutionary Generation, Nature, and the Shaping of the American Nation, was published to great acclaim in 2011. And her latest book, Chasing Venus, also received great acclaim when it was published in 2012 in eight different countries. Um, she's written for the New York Times, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, and many other publications, and made many broadcast appearances as well on both sides of the Atlantic. And we're also thrilled now to welcome Andrea back to Chestertown for the third visit, no, fourth, vi fourth visit now, wow. Yeah, so you're, we're going to have to like build you a special sort of palace here or something like that. We just, we love having you here and clearly Chestertown loves you. A cottage, okay. Um, our second guest is Eleanor Jones Harvey. Eleanor is senior curator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum where her research interests include 19th and 20th century American art, landscape painting, and Southwestern abstraction and Texas art. Her most recent exhibition, which I'm sure many of you saw, was the Civil War and American art um, a couple of years ago, which was absolutely one of the most stunning exhibitions on the Civil War and one of the most stunning exhibitions on 19th century American art, I think, that, that I've ever seen. Um, I, I went back to it, gosh, I must have been there at least 10 or 12 times when it was there in the uh, Smithsonian American Art Museum. And as I was just telling Eleanor, um, the last room of the exhibition with these four monumental Frederick Church paintings just literally made me drop to my knees. Um, absolutely, absolutely incredible achievement. Um, Eleanor uh, earned her bachelor's degree at, from the uh, University of Virginia and she holds both a master's degree and doctorate in art history from Yale. Um, and Eleanor's background, she originally um, went to school to study to be a geologist and decided for reasons she might explain um, why not to do that. But her interest in science and particularly in the science that underlies landscape is one that she's carried with her into her polymathic and interdisciplinary work. She's also most importantly, um, the mother of a Washington College sophomore, Caroline Harvey of the class of 2017. And two years after Caroline Harvey graduates in 2019, Eleanor will be unveiling a massive and massively important Smithsonian exhibition on von Humboldt. Um, and so she, uh, that'll be I think for the um, 150th, 250th anniversary of his birth, right? Um, 
Yeah, approximately. So uh, our final guest, um, Neil Safir, is the Beatrice and Julio Murillo Santo Domingo Director and Librarian of the John Carter Brown Library. I finally found somebody with a longer title than mine, Neil. That's really good. Um, which is based in Providence, Rhode Island, and is one of the world's greatest collections of books and manuscripts and other printed materials on the early Americas. Americas note the plural, which is something important in thinking about Humboldt that we will come back to. Um, Neil has a joint faculty appointment in the Department of History at Brown University. He received his PhD across the bay from us at Johns Hopkins and has held research and teaching appointments at um, many other universities. He is the author of Measuring the New World, Enlightenment, Science, and South America. And even though, as he has told me, he tried to avoid Humboldt in that book, it's a very Humboldtian topic, and he'll, he'll have a lot to tell us about Humboldt um, in the intellectual and cultural context of his times. Um, and his current research that Neil Safir is doing relates to the environmental and ethnographic history of the Amazon River Basin, important Humboldtian place, and the Atlantic world during the age of revolutions. So I'm very pleased to bring all these people together in conversation this evening. The way it's going to work is we'll hear from Andrea um, for about 20 minutes, who will give us a sort of an overview um, of Humboldt's life based on her own wonderful new book to sort of whet our appetites and give us some background. Um, and then I and Neil and Eleanor will join Andrea on stage and we'll have a conversation in which we talk particularly about the impact and influence of Humboldt in a wide variety of fields, both in his time and in ours. So please join me in welcoming Alexander von Humboldt and Andrea Wolf. Yeah, it's on now, yeah, perfect. Um, thank you so much for having me back. Uh, I do like coming here. I do also seem to choose really nice weather. So, um, so I have 20 minutes to tell you something about Humboldt, which is so unfair because he's like the most exciting person on the planet. So um, I'm going to rush through stuff. Um, hopefully we can talk a little bit about some other things um, during our conversation. But I wanted to start with a quote about Humboldt. Um, this is what Ralph Waldo Emerson said about him in 1869. Humboldt was one of those wonders of the world, like Aristotle, like Julius Caesar, who appear from time to time as if to show us the possibilities of the human mind. Yet, when I told um, people over the last few years that I'm writing a book about Alexander von Humboldt, the most common reaction I got was a blank face, because very few people have actually heard of him. It probably doesn't help that I say Humboldt, which I noticed that you also say Humboldt, instead of saying Humboldt, which is the American way of pronouncing it. Um, because if I would say Humboldt, um, more people will recognize his name. But I'm kind of refusing to say Humboldt because I'm German, he was German, and since he's almost forgotten here, we might as well to le learn to pronounce his name properly, Alexander von Humboldt. He is, his name, though, lingers everywhere. So, um, in fact, there are more places, plants, and animals named after Humboldt than anyone else in this world. And I'm just going to show you a few examples. So there's, for example, the Humboldt Current, which is the ocean current that hugs the west coast of um, South America. There is the Humboldt Penguin, the Californian Humboldt Lily, the, uh, and there's a giant um, fierce squid, which is named Humboldt, um, the Humboldt squid. Um, in Latin America, there are dozens of parks and mountains named after him. There are mountain ranges in China, in um, South Africa, in New Zealand. In North America alone, there are four counties and 13 towns named after him. There's a bay, there's a river, there's a mountain, there are parks. I could go on forever. Even the state of Nevada was almost called Humboldt, Humboldt uh, when the name was discussed in the 1860s. So the question is, who is this man? Well, let's start with a few facts. So he was um, born in 1769, the same year as Napoleon, and he was the second son of a wealthy 
Prussian aristocratic family in Berlin. And when his parents died, uh, he was left a very wealthy man. In fact, he was uh, so rich that he bragged, I have so much money that I can get my nose, mouth, and ears gilded. So we also know he was a bit of a show off. Um, but he left his life of privilege and went on a five-year um, exploration through Latin America, where he spent pretty much almost his entire inheritance. And it was a voyage that shaped his life and his thinking, and that made him really legendary across the world. He was a visionary thinker and scientist, and his contemporaries described him as the most famous man after Napoleon. They called him the Shakespeare of the sciences. He wrote many books, uh, which were huge international bestsellers. In fact, he wrote so many books that he himself lost track how many he had written and when they were published. He was, as one contemporary said, the greatest man since the deluge. He influenced artists, scientists, writers, and poets. Um, Thomas Jefferson, for example, called him one of the greatest ornaments of the age. Napoleon was jealous of Humboldt. Charles Darwin said he would have not boarded the beagle and therefore not conceived of the origin of species without Humboldt. Henry David Thoreau's Walden would have been a very different book without him. John Muir's ideas on forest preservation were heavily influenced by him. Simon Bolivar called him the discoverer of the new world, and the painter Frederick Church was followed Humboldt's footsteps to paint um, the, Latin Amer the South American um, landscape. But he's also the one who followed most closely Humboldt's suggestion that the art and the sciences should be bring brought together. And even Captain Nemo in um, Jules Verne's famous 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea owned all of Humboldt's books. So he died in 1859 just a few months before his 90th birthday, and actually a few months before The Origin of Species was published. And 10 years later, the um, centennial of his birth was celebrated across the world on the 14th of September, 1869. And there were parties everywhere, in Melbourne, in Mexico City, in Buenos Aires, in Berlin, you name it, they had parties. And some of the greatest celebrations were actually in the United States. There were... Um, for example, 25,000 people who marched through Manhattan in his honor. So America was utterly in love with Humboldt, yet today he's almost forgotten here. So the question is, why should we care about a man who's dead and who's almost forgotten? Clearly, I think there are many reasons, because otherwise I would have not written this book. Um, and I think one of the really important reasons is that Humboldt came up with a concept of nature that still very much shapes our thinking today. He came up with the idea that nature is a web of life. He described Earth as a living organism where everything was connected, from the tiniest insect to the tallest tree. He brought together the arts and the sciences when he said, for example, that we had to use our imagination and our feelings to understand nature. He's also the forgotten father of environmentalism, excuse me, <clears throat> of environmentalism, because he warned of the devastating effects of monoculture, deforestation, and irrigation. And amazingly, he predicted harmful human-induced climate change already in 1800. So he was a genius polymath who roamed across the disciplines. He, for example, discovered the magnetic equator in South America. He also invented isotherms, which are the wavy lines which we see today on weather maps. He, a hundred, more than 100 years before scientists um, talked about shifting, shifting tectonic plates, he was talking about the ancient connection between Africa and uh, South America. He understood the idea of a keystone species 200 years before the concept was named. And he defined global climate and vegetation zones at a time when other scientists were looking through the narrow lens of classification. Now, all of this is incredibly important, 
But I think what's more important than his individual discoveries is that he comes up, comes up with a worldview, a holistic worldview that very much colors our thinking of nature today. So my book, The Invention of Nature, is my attempt to find Humboldt, but also to restore him to his rightful place in the pantheon of science and nature. And the great thing um, when writing and researching an explorer is that you get to travel to pretty amazing places yourself, obviously all in the name um, of research. And because Humboldt was a bit of a show off, I'm going to be a bit of a show off. So um, I went to Berlin, for example, to read his manuscripts in the archives there. And as you can see, that man has a terrible handwriting. I think that was the only bad thing about um, writing this book. In Quito, in the archives, I found his, um, his uh, Spanish passport. With, he traveled with them um, through the Spanish colonies there. I went up the Antisana, which is a volcano in Ecuador. And at 13,000 feet, I found this hut in which Humboldt had spent a night. And at that moment, there were four condors circling above me, and a herd of wild horses suddenly appeared. So that was a pretty good moment. Um, I paddled along the Orinoco in the rainforest of Venezuela. I walked around Walden Pond in freshly fallen snow. I went to the Yosemite Valley. Um, where John Muir had implemented so many of Humboldt's ideas on forest preservation. And appropriately, when researching a, um, an explorer, I also experienced a hurricane, although admittedly not in Latin America, but when I got stuck in Hurricane Sandy in October 2012. And I just made it, I think an hour before, I had to give my talk here coming from there because uh, Michael picked me up in Philadelphia. But the most exciting moment for me was when I finally um, climbed Chimborazo, the volcano in the Andes that was so elemental for Humboldt's vision of nature. And as I walked up the barren mountain slope, my admiration for Humboldt grew with every single step. So I made it only to 16,400 feet, but he um, went even higher. But it was. Um, he went up there in June 1802 together with his travel companion, the French botanist Aimé Bonplan. And, um, and normally I kind of tell the story what they do, but we have to kind of shorten this now. So basically they managed to get up to almost, um, uh, to a little bit more than 19,000 feet. Chimborazo was um, al almost 21,000 feet and at that time believed to be the highest mountain in the world. So when they are almost at the top, um, Humboldt kind of looks down and he sees the kind of mountain ranges folded below him. And he's really standing on the top of the world and his vision of nature clarifies in that moment and everything falls into place. And what he realized is that the journey he had taken from Quito, which is about 100 miles um, north of Chimborazo, from Quito up the Chimborazo was like a botanical journey from the equator to the poles. So he had seen the tropical species in the valleys, like banana trees and palm trees. And then he had seen how the vegetation had changed with altitude. Um, and this is, this is uh, one of his paintings in, or one of the paintings in one of his books. And this is, uh, this is his Naturgemälde. And this is what he does after he's been to the Chimborazo. And you can see all these little um, words in the cross section of the mountain. These are the, the um, plants he finds at certain altitudes. So he's, um, he looks at nature so differently to anyone um, else because he looks at nature in terms of um, vegetation zones. And he realizes that a lot of the plants he had seen on this journey from Quito up the Chimborazo were similar to plants he had el seen elsewhere on the planet. He had seen them similar, he'd seen similar plants in the Alps in Switzerland, in the Pyrenees in Spain, and also in Tenerife. And he looks at them and he realizes that there are global vegetation zones, which are like these wavy belts which are slung across the globe. So no one had looked at nature like this before because everyone else was still very much looking through trying to make sense of nature through classification. 
But let me tell you a little bit about um, his exploration. So he and Bonplan left Europe in June 1799, and they spent five years in um, Latin America. And I'm going to have to skip over some really exciting bits, and you're going to have to read the book for that. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor what kind of man Humboldt was. But first of all, he was unbelievably restless. He has a restless mind um, that really never stops until he dies. And he himself admits that he was impelled by a perpetual drive as if chased by 10,000 pigs. He was also obsessed with measurements, and he schlepped 42 scientific instruments, all packed individually in velvet-lined boxes across Latin America. He took, for example, a telescope, a travel barometer, a huge pendulum clock, and a hygrometer, which he used to um, measure the uh, humidity with. But he was not just interested in empirical data. He also said that in order to understand nature, we needed to feel nature. So where other scientists were searching for universal laws, Humboldt said that nature must be experienced through feeling and imagination. He was really driven by this kind of sense of wonder. He was, of course, brazenly adventurous. Um, if you take, for example, his journey along the Orinoco and the surrounding river networks, um, he and Bonplan paddled 1,400 miles along the rivers, 75 grueling days deep in the rainforest where very few white men had ever been. And of course, it made for dangerous um, traveling. Their boat, for example, capsized. They're almost starved to death. They encountered dangerous animals such as crocodiles and jaguars and snakes. Um, but they also encountered the most magnificent ecosystem on this planet, they encounter the most magnificent web of life in the rainforest. And Humboldt was interested in everything. And uh, he tasted, for example, the water of the different rivers like a wine connoisseur. He was fascinated by plants and animals, such as the um, howler monkey, and listened to their strange bellowing cries that traveled for several miles through the jungle. He discovered the Brazil nut and subsequently introduced it to Europe. But he also was fascinated by the indigenous people. And he very often included them in his landscape paintings. He thought that he very often questioned them, and he thought, or he described them as the best observers of nature, the best geographers. And I just wanted to show you a couple. So these are, these are beautiful, huge books. Um, and you can see the, two, the three figures there. And here's a, um, a detail, which is my favorite. Humboldt is, of course, the one with the top hat and the very muscular um, legs and bottom also. So he brought home sketches of Inca monuments and Aztec manuscripts, showing the Europeans that these ancient civilizations were sophisticated cultures with rich um, ar um, architecture and languages. But he also saw um, that humankind was destroying nature. And he realized that in particular in, in, in this area at Lake Valencia, which is an agricultural region in northern Venezuela. And what he saw here was that the trees had been felled to make way for cash crops, that then heavy rains had washed off the good topsoil, that also the water levels of the river of the lake were falling because the farmers had diverted the water to irrigate um, their fields. And seeing the destruction here, the environmental destruction here, he's the very first to explain the fundamental functions of a forest for the ecosystem and the climate. He talked about the tree's ability to store water, the tree's ability to enrich the atmosphere with moisture, their, um, their protection against soil erosion, and also um, their cooling effect. And it was here at Lake Valencia that he first talked about harmful human-induced climate change. He wrote about mankind's mischief, which disturbs nature's order. And then, a few years later, he lists the three ways in which humankind was affecting the climate. And this is what he writes. 
They do this through the destructions of forests, through the distribution of water, i.e. irrigation, and through the production of great masses of steam and gas at the industrial centers. Pretty amazing. In 1832, um, we've not learned um, much from this. Um, Humboldt and Bonpland travel from Venezuela up to Cuba, and then they travel back to um, what's today the northern coast of um, Colombia. They then travel 2,500 miles south to Lima. Most of this, they travel through the Andes. And as they travel through the Andes, they climb every reachable volcano there is. So by the time they reach Chimborazo in June 1802, they are the most experienced mountaineers in the world. And um, there's a wonderful le letter that Humboldt writes to a friend in Germany from Latin America, where he first in great detail describes all you know, the dangers he had encountered um, with jaguars and crocodiles. And then he ends this long letter with this question. And you, dearest, how is your monotonous life? <laughs> so he is a bit of a show off. Um, in April 1804, after they had also spent a year in Mexico, they leave Latin America and they return to Europe. But the, Humboldt adds a little detour. He um, travels to Washington, D.C., because he wants to meet Thomas Jefferson, uh, the president um, of the United States, as you do. And um, the timing of this visit was absolutely perfect because Jefferson had just acquired the Louisiana Territory in the previous year. And Humboldt had just spent a year in Mexico in the archives, a lot of time in the archives also. So Jefferson bombarded Humboldt with questions about their new neighbor, um, Mexico, and Humboldt delivered plentiful. So he basically unpacked his maps and his notebooks. And he spent six weeks in the United States. And I'm not going to talk about this because I hope that um, Eleanor is going to talk a little bit about it. So I can skip over this really quickly, but it's fascinating. Um, in August 1804, Humboldt arrives in Europe and he settles in Paris because there's no other city at that time so uh, uh, deeply steeped in the sciences as Paris um, in the beginning of the 19th century. And he very quickly established himself as the center of scientific inquiry. And he spent um, more than two decades in Paris. And I'm going to have to skip over that too now. Um, but in 1827, after more than two decades in Paris, aged 57, Humboldt decides to leave Paris and to move to Berlin, a city he absolutely hated for its narrow-mindedness. And one of the reasons was that the Prussian king had paid him for more than 20 years an annual stipend, and uh, that the Prussian king was now requesting his return to the Prussian court. And having completely run out of money, because he'd spent his entire in inheritance on his explorations, but also on his many publications, Humboldt really didn't have much of a choice. So he moved back to Berlin. Uh, very reluctantly, but he did manage to have some fun there because two years later, he goes on yet another exploration. In 1829, he uh, travels to Russia, an exploration that was paid for by the Russian Tsar, 10,000 miles, um, aged 60, and he did this all in less than six months. So he was really not calming down at all with age, and he collected the kind of data he needed to do this global investigation of Earth. And when he returned uh, to Berlin after this expedition, he was fizzing with so many ideas that a friend said that Humboldt was steaming like a pot of boiling water. He was finally ready to write the book that would make him most famous in, in America. He wrote a book called Cosmos. It took him more than 10 years to write just the first volume. Um, it was a huge international bestseller. He, um, it was translated into a dozen languages, and it was a book that was unlike any other book ever published. He took his readers on an incredible journey from Earth to outer space, from the tiniest fleck of moss to the highest peaks of volcanoes, from botany to poetry, and landscape painting. 
where other scientists were crawling into their narrowing disciplines, Humboldt wrote a book that did exactly the opposite. He wrote a book that connected everything and brought everything together. It was a portrait of nature pulsating with life, and it was really his declaration of love to nature. And in Cosmos, he wrote, for example, descriptions of nature may be scientifically correct without being deprived of the vivifying breath of imagination. So he brought together scientific observations, imagination, and evocative landscape um, descriptions. No one had done this before. <clears throat> and he wrote of a deeply seated bond which unites natural knowledge with poetry and with artistic feeling. And this was really the book that made him so famous in the United States. And my book is really as much about Humboldt as it is about the people he influenced. And I really do not have time to talk about this at all. So I'm just going to show you. Um, so I had to pick eight of them, um, which was difficult enough. Um, each of them gets a chapter in the book. Uh, there's the German poet Goethe, Thomas Jefferson, Simon Bolivar, Charles Darwin, uh, Henry David Thoreau, the German scientist Ernst Haeckel, who coined the word um, ecology and who also brought together the arts and the sciences, John Muir and George Perkins Marsh, who wrote a book called Man and Nature in 1864, which I think is one of the most important environmental books ever published here. And um, I would just like to end with one little thing, um, just because I think it's important to remember why he is still so important. And um, normally I go into kind of great length here. Maybe we can discuss this a little bit later. But Humboldt comes up with this concept of nature, that nature is a web of life. And he is so interdisciplinary. And today, when we are trying to figure out the consequences um, of global climate change, his methods and his concept of nature, one of global patterns, I think, is incredibly important. And almost too perfectly, three weeks ago, when my book was published, um, <clears throat> there was an article published in the Journal of the National Academy of the Sciences, where climate scientists had traced Humboldt's footsteps up the Chimborazo. So they had taken this Naturgemilde. They had looked at where he had found plants on which altitude, and they had discovered 210 10 years later, they discovered that the plants had moved 500 meters up. So they had used Humboldt's historic data um, in you know, very, very modern climate change um, science. And I, so for me, that was really the moment where I thought, you know, this has really come full circle for me. If someone like Humboldt can still be useful today, not just through his ideas, but even through his historic data. So I'm done, I think. Yes, that was such a rush. <laughs>
public libraries in America burn German books. So this is not really the moment to celebrate a German scientist. But also, I think, and we shouldn't forget that, is that I think because he comes up with a worldview, rather than he doesn't invent, you know, he doesn't come up with a universal law, or he doesn't discover a continent. So there's not one thing you can just pin his mm. name to. So, but it's a lot of things. So it's almost like his ideas have become so self-evident that the man behind the, these ideas has almost disappeared. I think that might be one reason. Mm. And another one might be that he's, you know, he dies in 1859, which I would say is pretty much the last moment where one person can hold all the knowledge of the world in one head. So he's a polymath. But um, after that, the sciences become so specialized, and the experts begin to look down on people like Humboldt. They're, he's like a dilettante, like an amateur. So he, you know, they, they, these polymaths kind of get pushed away. And I think there's a renaissance. There's a kind of mm -hmm. reawakened interest in people like this, because we are all talking about interdisciplinary approaches. And we understand that for things like climate change um, studies, we might need scientists from different um, disciplines to work on this. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a good time for him to be rediscovered in a way. Well, that's what I hope. Um, I want to uh, turn now um, to you, um, to Neil Safir, and, and ask you, um, as a historian of, um, of science and of intellectual life, but whose work specializes more in the 18th century, well, Humboldt, um, was born in 1769, so um, six years before the American Revolution. Lived until 1859, so right before the American Civil War, for those of us who measure things by American wars. <laughs> um, but he really was somebody who's, whose life spanned the 18th century and the 19th century in, in so many respects. Um, do you see him, and Andrea early in the book talks about him as, as I think you use the term, child of the Enlightenment, um, of the 18th century Enlightenment. But, do you see him really as more of an 18th century person carrying those ideas forward into the age of the Industrial Revolution and sort of sweeping global political revolutions? Or do you see him perhaps as somebody um, who was kind of foreshadowing those 19th century ideas at a time when nobody else was having them yet? Or is he some combination of the two? Well, I think that um, uh, as a, tra as a trained historian, <clears throat> I think mo more than anything else, uh, and Humboldt offers a wonderful opportunity to do this, uh, we, we, are, we are trained to argue against uh, trying to see any single individual as a representative of any particular moment. Um, in many ways, we apply the term enlightenment to anything that happens in the 18th century, the Romantic period to the 19th century, but in fact, when we dig down more deeply in, uh, uh, and, and as historians of science, we are absolutely trained to do this, we recognize that individuals are drawing from a whole range of, and strands of different traditions. So in fact, um, trying to apply the moniker of the Enlightenment uh, to an individual or a Romantic um, is problematic at the outset. Um, I, th I think, however, that uh, Humboldt was certainly somebody who embodied certain aspects of what we would later call um, Enlightenment thinking. He was certainly an advocate, and Andrea pointed this out quite clearly, of the idea that all things in the natural world could be measured. Uh, and that was an empirical impulse that, in fact, is not only um, coming out of the Enlightenment, the 18th century, but actually stretches even further. It stretches back to an impulse that saw the discovery of the new world. Because if there were any empiricists uh, in the early period, it was the Spanish and the Portuguese. The Spanish and the Portuguese arrived in the new world and began to take measurements and, and take assessments of everything that they really could. Um, this, is actually, this actually may be one of the other reasons that Humboldt has been forgotten, which is a word that we uh, sometimes refer to as nationalism. Um, it shouldn't come as a surprise at Washington College that uh, people in the United States are invested in, like many countries, in aggrandizing the scientific tra tra um, um, traditions that grew out of the individuals who were seen as the founding, the founding fathers. 
uh, somebody uh, from um, Spanish America is clearly not uh, understood uh, or who, who may have been influenced by Spanish America as Humboldt very seriously was, may not be seen to have contributed as much to the birth of, um, of the national kinds of scientific um, interests. So I think that's important to point out. And in fact, uh, Humboldt arrived uh, it, at a very important time in the history of Spanish America. It was in many ways called the Second Conquest, um, the era of the Bourbon reforms, when the Spanish were trying to get as much knowledge and as much value, uh, treasure out of the New World after the mining that they had so relied on in an earlier period had begun to run its course. And so the kinds of people that Humboldt came across, uh, people like uh, Jose Celestino Mutis, uh, Jose Antonio Caldas, um, and later, of course, people like Jefferson, uh, were actually representatives of the latest scientific thinking in the New World. And so I think that it's very important um, to place Humboldt in, back into that context as well as somebody who, as Andrea points out in her book, was a consummate networker. That's certainly one of his modern mm -hmm. characteristics. And somebody who knew how to demonstrate all of the different sources that he was drawing upon to bring his knowledge to bear. The last thing that I will point out, which I think makes him both an enlightenment and a romantic figure, um, is his interest in using his own body as a scientific mm -hmm. instrument. Um, this is not necessarily exclusively a romantic thing. This is actually something that people who've studied 18th century science have recognized that the emotions, the sensations, were part and parcel of what people were discovering was part of what science could be about in that period. And Humboldt very clearly and directly from his experiments with uh, electric eels to other kinds of strange, bizarre things that he put on his skin, uh, really, I think, mm -hmm. exemplified this kind of idea that it was our task as human beings to understand the world through our own sensations. And that really allows him to bridge, I think, the 18th and 19th century in effective ways. I'd love to hear, maybe we can hear the uh, electric eel story in a few, <laughs> in a few minutes. It's a cool but, story. Uh, I, I, you know, like thinking about uh, about Humboldt, he does seem like somebody um, with whom the sort of the personality and the opportunities of the times came together perfectly. And he, in some ways, you know, Leonardo was a sort of a Humboldt in possibility, Humboldt in potential. But Leonardo was limited to his little ambit of, you know. Um, Milan and Florence and the Loire Valley was the farthest he got. Where, think of if you had taken Leonardo and he'd been able to go all over the world and hopping across the continents and communicating with millions of readers all over the world or millions of viewers all over the world. And so Humboldt, I think, was, was benefiting clearly from those new technologies of communication and, and science um, that his lifetime saw come into place. So many were invented, telegraph, photography during during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. so um, I was just going to say one quick thing, yeah. which is that another important historical uh, term which is very relevant to, his, to Humboldt's life is contingency. It, we should not forget that Humboldt, the only reason that he went to South America in the first place yeah. was that he missed the boat to go on an expedition to Australia, the mm -hmm. expedition by, uh, that, in, uh, that was run by Nicolas Baudin. Mm -hmm. um, and so he ended up in Spain and he went to the went to the king. I'm sure Andrea. Well, he was he 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 failed to. I mean, he asked everybody, and then finally he he wanted to go, join Napoleon in Egypt, actually, and then um, missed that boat, and then just got fed up, and then went to <laughs> Spain. And surprisingly, the Spanish king gave him permission, which was very very rare. But you're right. It's, it, there's a lot of serendipity in there. Um, and so maybe we can uh, talk as well. Um, that brings up the question of, of Humboldt and Darwin and Humboldt's, um, mm -hmm. and I know you've written about that as well, Andreas. But uh, I'd like to hear from Eleanor Harvey um, now to talk about right. how this scientist had an impact on um, culture, on visual arts, on literature that um, <clears throat> almost every other scientist can only dream of having. 
Well, it is an interesting story because Humboldt turns out to be pretty much everywhere. And one of the things that I'm doing is, again, as Andrea is dealing with the issue of um, how do you end up describing a man that nobody recognizes, particularly in the fine arts where someone says, is he some artist that I've never actually heard of? And it's mm -hmm. like, no. Um, although in this painting, which is in the Smithsonian American Art Museum, um, oh dear, bring it back. Um, this is, all right, we're pushing all the wrong buttons. There we go. We'll try that one. Um, this is the hacienda Humboldt stayed in with little Humboldt working his way toward it at the base of Cotopaxi because Frederick Church really is a fanboy, which really you can say about most of the people alive during the 19th century. And so what I'm going to do is give you a roller coaster visual romp through the six degrees of separation with Alexander von Humboldt at the very center of it. When he arrives in, uh, after his trip in South America and Mexico, he arrives in Washington bearing fossilized mammoth teeth because he knows Jefferson is really interested in fossilized mastodons. And he's like, I have teeth. Will you meet with me? And it's like, Jefferson's like, well, sure. The guy who gets to bring him is Charles Wilson Peale, who must have been wrigglingly happy to take him from Philadelphia to the White House. Um, and Peale will, in fact, orchestrate his own museum based on Humboldt's web of life. So those dinnertime conversations during those six weeks must have been pretty fascinating. Um, he does, as Andrea pointed out, yield up his map of Mexico by saying to Jefferson, congratulations on the Louisiana Purchase. Would you like to know what you just got? <laughs> Jefferson is busy asking questions about the lower Mexico region because, of course, he sent Lewis and Clark up north. And there are some who believe that this will start the American imperialist adventure, which will end up with the Mexican-American War and the annexation of even more territory to flesh out what is the modern United States. Zebulon Pike will steal the map, copy it, and try to pass it off as his own. Albert Gallatin, Secretary of State, has to step in and prevent a diplomatic incident. Um, John Fremont will take uh, Humboldt's ideas west and will go on a naming spree to name the Humboldt Desert, the Humboldt Mountains, the Humboldt River, um, and will end up sort of adopting the Humboldtian mantle when he runs for president in 1859 and loses to James Buchanan. Um, Stephen Long will map the middle of the continent with Titian Ramsey Peale as his artist, who will then go on the Wilkes expedition, having learned from Humboldt at his father's knee. Um, Humboldt will end up pitching to James Madison no fewer than six possible routes for a future Panama Canal. Um, he will become friends with Albert Gallatin, who will write his ethnography of the Indians of the United States at Humboldt's urging. Um, he will, Humboldt will fund Carl Bodmer's trip across the United States with Prince Maximilian to paint American Indians, George Catton, and then, of course, this is Humboldt's map of isotherms and isobars in geographical regions. This is his web of life that you saw earlier. This is one of the first cross sections showing in this case volcanic activity because Humboldt begins to understand that uh, volcanoes and earthquakes are somehow networked together long before anybody comes up with plate tectonics and an understanding of American, of uh, the, the structure of the globe. Um, as you learned, Frederick Church will spend time not once but twice in South America, literally following in Humboldt's footsteps. Um, he will stay in the same places. He will write in his diary about climbing the same mountains. And this picture of the heart of the Andes is really meant as an homage to Humboldt going from the Amazon River Basin up to the top of the mountain, following, in a sense, the same climactic zones that you see in Humboldt's map. Um, George Catlin will go to Berlin, and as a result of that, will go to South America and paint the destruction of the, Ameri of the flamingos. Um, you've got Martin Johnson Heed, who will go and pair up hummings and or uh, orchids and hummingbirds based on, again, the understanding of symbiotic relationships between different parts of the biosphere. You have Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman declaring himself a cosmos because Humboldt wrote a book called Cosmos. This isn't where it ends, though, because then you end up with Humboldt, who believes deep in his soul that all men really are created equal. He believes that race does not, in fact, have a bearing on your intelligence or your ability. Says to Thomas Jefferson, love your country, feel like I'm half American, you really ought to get rid of slavery. Then he says, well, you know, you're the president, maybe I overstepped, but seriously, get rid of it. <laughs> he writes about his abolitionist feelings. These letters are published by Wendell Garrison in The Liberator. 
they are read by Frederick Douglass. They become the fundament of American abolitionism, and in 1858, Humboldt is declared the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society's Man of the Year. Um, he gets Louis Agassiz, his job at Harvard, um, and we get from that the Museums of Comparative Zoology, the Natural History Museum, and the Peabody. He meets James Smithson at a cocktail party in Paris in 1814, and I'm beginning to believe that Smithson had a little help in coming up with the idea of funding an institution for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. Um, he ends up influencing all four of the great Western surveys. This is John Wesley Powell, who will not only be the first white man to raft successfully the length of the Colorado River, but he will also then, in his position, leading the Bureau of Ethnography at the Smithsonian, found the Cosmos Club, named because of Humboldt's book, which brings together then, as now, all of the heavy intellectual thinkers across the disciplines in Washington, D.C. Clarence King, looking romantic in a uh, uh, hanging from the ropes there, will go out in order to prove some of the ideas that Humboldt holds dear, and he will take with him the photographer Timothy O'Sullivan, who will end up making the images that illustrate his um, survey reports that come back to the federal government. And of course, then you get John Muir on the right and Teddy Roosevelt on the left, camping in the Eastern Sierra in Yosemite in 1903. Um, Muir has already declared, oh, how I long to be a Humboldt, and Tom, uh, Teddy Roosevelt has already groused to him that the problem with America's educational system is that now we are turning out specialists. We are no longer turning out thinkers like Humboldt, and he sees this as a flaw in the American character to go way too deep without having the breadth in order to support it. So you have Humboldt, who is basically influencing your entire college curriculum, <laughs> um, starting, oh, you, you can, you, I understand you've got your courses out for, for the spring semester. You check this out. Anthropology, botany, geography, geophysics, oceanography, physiology, zoology, um, geology and volcanic formation, the magnetic equator, climatology, meteorology, cartography. You can begin to understand that it, how easy it is to lose Humboldt in the welter of things in which he influenced. And so when you get um, Teddy Roosevelt with his famous pronouncement about this. It's little wonder then that the excavation of Humboldt really is a matter of subtracting in a way what has happened in the, pre in the intervening two centuries in order to begin to understand how Humboldt lies as like the foundation layer underneath all of this. And so my job at the Smithsonian is to really, in a sense, dust for Humboldt's fingerprints across the Smithsonian in order to make clear not only how the institution ends up being, in effect, the physical manifestation, unpacking Humboldt's brain, if you will, in 19 bureaus and, uh, and hundreds of different disciplines, but also to look across the collections at the Smithsonian and beyond in order to use American art as a lens through which to make Humboldt visible again, to follow those tentacles. He is a botanist by trade, and so if you will, that root system really cuts across all disciplines and digs deep into the American soil. Um, and so for me, this is an opportunity to really understand why places like the Smithsonian exist, why people like Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson refer back to him using the term cosmos as a way of trying to understand how everything is, in fact, organically and holistically connected to everything else. I have absolutely no idea what this exhibition will look like at this point, but Adam has so far steered to me several really fabulous interns from the Star Center who have been tasked with taking chunks of Humboldt and Humboldt's experience in order to provide me with the ammunition that I need in order to develop the ideas. Um, so as Adam optimistically says, 2019, watch this space. Um, but we'll see, in fact, where Humboldt ends up leading me as we uh, sort of careen around American art, culture, literature, exploration, and politics. So, um, so this morning, early this morning, I was emailing with Eleanor, and yeah. she said, you know, I think I might like to show a couple of slides, of, uh, it's not too much trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. So, did you just put this together in the last few hours, Eleanor? You know, I should say yes, but no. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually doing a lunch bag talk at the Smithsonian later this month that's okay. um, basically called Humboldt or Why a German Naturalist Mar Matters to American Art. 
and I was playing with the animations on PowerPoint because I'm a geek, and what can I say? Um, I like that kind of stuff. And um, I figured, okay, fine, if I can manage to whip through this as fast as I think I can, this should just about do. Awesome. Well, thank you so for there that. You go. Um, so there is there there's a there's a big person who um, we haven't talked about yet, and as I mentioned, that's uh, Charles Darwin, um, who had an incredibly interesting, and there were so many figures who had interesting and complicated relationships, but I wonder if, Andrea, you could talk a little bit about Darwin and Humboldt. Well, they, so Darwin basically uh, reads Humboldt's books as a young man, uh, in particular mm -hmm. Humboldt's book, Personal Narrative, which is partly a travel account and partly a scientific uh, treatise of his um, five-year voyage in, in Latin America. And Darwin basically says that it's because he read the personal narrative that made him want to join the Beagle, that made him want to go to South America because he wanted to see the same landscapes. And uh, the amazing thing is that the books, the Humboldt books that Darwin owned that went with him on the Beagle still exist in an archive today. Mm. And when you look at them, they make for absolute remarkable reading because they are fully annotated. I mean, it, it's just like listening to Darwin having a conversation with Humboldt because Humboldt influenced him in so many different ways. So for example, well, he made him go to South America. Once he's in South America, he really uses Humboldt's books, Humboldt's writing as a lens through which to see the new world. He constantly says, like, you know, I am at present only fit to read Humboldt. It's almost like he needs this lens to understand what he's seeing. And then later, he uses um, Humboldt's books as a model for his own writing. So the Voyage of the Beagle is very similar in style. And then when he's working on his evolutionary theory, he is using Humboldt's book as a, basically a source material to find, um, to find examples. And that's what I, I got very excited about, because there are, there are moments where um, he underlines, for example, Humboldt describes how the capybaras, which are the world's largest rodents, how they, their, their population basically gets um, checked by the jaguars. And, uh, and Humboldt writes about that. And, and Darwin writes into the margin, like, what a positive check. Um, so he, you know, so he, he, he's <coughs> reading this, kind of making up his mind while he's working on, on his evolutionary theory. And there are contemporaries of, of um, Humboldt, who say that he was a pre-Darwinian Darwinist. And he talks about um, uh, changing um, species. He talks about nature and flux. So I think he, he's much more influential on Darwin than you know, most people might think. It's almost like he was there. You picture him sort of stowing away along on the, on the voyage of the Beagle, wasn't he? And if you'd like mm -hmm. to jump in with some comments as well on Darwinism and well, you know, it is interesting because when you have this sort of tectonic moment in 1859 when Humboldt dies and the origin of species comes out and it's as though you flick off the light switch in one room and turn it on in the next. And there have been some arguments that one of the reasons that Humboldt's star dims is because Darwin's is on the rise and you have Humboldt positing a cosmos in which everything connects with everything else and Darwin throwing in the variables of um, natural selection and random mutation by saying it's not all that easy, it's not all that predictable, and, and that the two somehow end up at odds with each other. There are some that would say that then they are brought back and woven together by Rachel Carson when she writes Silent Spring. And she basically talks about the perils of human intervention in the environment, but also talks about the need for humans to do something to save things that are on the verge of extinction. And so it is as though she takes the idea of what we want is something that's more Humboldtian, which means we need to control the Darwinian uh, variables mm. in order to try to keep things more on an even keel. Um, and so I think that for a lot of, I mean, for Frederick Church, who is alive at the time, the, the dilemma is very real. You go from a Humboldtian vision of, you know, God's in his heavens, all's right in the world, even though Humboldt's an atheist, or at least close to it, and, you know, there are a lot of people who feel that there is a sort of spiritual pantheistic value to a walk in the woods without professing a belief in any particular deity, hence you're transcendentalists. Um, but what you do end up with is having that kind of faith shaken 
by the idea that Darwin brings out that there really isn't some kind of all-encompassing harmonic that actually is designed to keep the universe in stability. And you get into the 20th century with the instability of world wars, and you can easily believe that Humboldt is a romantic and not much of a realist, and that the Darwinian look is more Orwellian, but in fact closer to you know, empirical reality. And I think that they operate in a sense like Foucault's pendulum, it, it swings back and forth. And I think it's really important to understand that it's not all of one or all of the other, and that those voices together are what matter. And I think at the moment where it's like the, the passing of the baton from one to the other, they don't seem to be reconcilable. Mm. Well, it, it's interesting. At the, at the risk of going meta, meta on the conversation, I think one, one thing that's interesting about what you just said um, demonstrates to what extent we have absorbed Darwinism mm -hmm. um, in the intellectual sphere as well, which is that one idea kills off yeah. the other and that these ideas then become incompatible. And, um, and I think we, we, we follow down that road at our own peril. And I, think, right. um, I think the rediscovery of Alexander von Humboldt is also an, an understand is also really why it is that we study history in the first place why it's so essential to go back to these figures not to say wow they really got it wrong but in fact how much did they have it right yeah. how much were they tr attempting to weigh what we might consider to be incompatible ideas and they figured out a way to do that and those ideas are actually the ones that can have a relevance and importance for us today as well. So I think it's, mm -hmm. it's always important when we study the intellectual mm -hmm. history, um, certainly of science, but we can do it in a number of fields as well, to recognize that um, there is a, there, we have a tendency to want to see things in a very linear yeah. way um, that I think does a disservice to well, and, the complexity. And the, and the interesting mm -hmm. thing is actually that most people have read Humboldt through the kind of Darwinian lens and actually read him wrongly because yeah. he is not, Humboldt is never talking about this is just one beautiful harmonious thing. He right. talks about, you know, uh, battles. He talks about so, um, animals kind of, um, the, I mean, he describes, for example, the noise in the jungle and he unpeels this chain of reaction of, yeah. you know, jaguars charging after uh, tapers, uh, they wake up the monkeys, the monkeys and wake up the birds and this. And then he said, it sounds like this kind of, you know, contest in the, in the jungle. So mm -hmm. he's actually bringing these ideas in. It's just when we look back that we mm -hmm. think like, oh, there was Darwin. And before Darwin, everything was different. And just as what you said earlier, just as we can't see Humboldt as just standing on his own in this world. Yeah. We can't look at, you know, 1859 is the beginning of everything. Um, it's just mm -hmm. not. I mean, Darwin learns from other people. I mean, Darwin himself writes in The Origin of Species his list of people who have influenced yeah. him. And, uh, and I think that the same with Humboldt. And I, I think that's what I like about Humboldt also a lot, is that he, when he has problems, you know, not understanding a new theory, he calls up a friend and he yeah. says, can you please explain this to me? This, I don't understand. And speaking of, of, of uh, influence, um, Humboldt might also, I mean, besides being the inventor of nature, he might be called the inventor of South America in some respects. And there's a part of the world where Humboldt is still known by every school child. And I wonder if you could talk about the way that he sort of invented South America in some respects. Well, I can, I can definitely say that um, uh, the Portuguese, uh, the, the, the king of Portugal, did not allow Humboldt to actually enter into uh, what we now call Brazil, um, which is why, mm -hmm. if you so, saw in the, in the map that Andrea put up earlier, he sort of does a little bit of a dance <laughs> right around mm -hmm. what is now understood to be the, the border. Um, later on, uh, you know, if you speak to Brazilians today, they said how completely stupid <laughs> it was of the, of the Portuguese king to not allow uh, humble to go in because not he wasn't going to be stealing the secret of nature. He was going to be bringing a different kind of mentality and a different mm -hmm. kind of sort of scientific uh, scientific view. So I think that that I mean I think Humboldt interestingly inhabits this position where um, uh, he is not seen as the harbinger of a kind of European imperialist mm -hmm. model 
that is so prevalent in Latin America more generally and really defines in many ways the relationship that has existed between North America and, um, and Latin America. Um, he is, and I think one of the reasons is that for the most part, but not exclusively, um, Humboldt treated indigenous traditions and local Creole traditions with a great deal of respect and applied a certain mm -hmm. kind of um, scientific process to all of the different kinds of information that yeah. he came across. Uh, I say not exclusively because there were certainly moments that he discounted uh, the participation of certain kinds of indigenous uh, groups if those, it, that, that evidence didn't really fit into his own, uh, his own ideas. But I think that he is still very much, he, he participated in so many crucial moments of the consolidation of a national identity in so many of the places that he passed through. What, we're at uh, uh, New Granada, which became Colombia, uh, Cuba, uh, Mexico. These were moments that the Creole elite of those, those proto-countries were in the process of figuring out what it was that would lead them to uh, separate from the mother country. And, I mean, interestingly, Simon Bolivar, who, you know, the liberator, um, he says that it was um, Humboldt who awakened South America with his pen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, a re that's really interesting because it was almost like as if Humboldt, so Humboldt comes back to Europe in 1804 with a portrait of Latin America as this magnificent continent. While, you know, you had only 20 years before you have uh, French scientists like Buffon talking about the degeneracy of, um, of the Americas, mm -hmm. which is something that Jefferson kind of fought very strongly to kind of um, prove him wrong. But the idea was basically that the, the French said that everything um, degenerates, kind of the, the animals are smaller, the trees are smaller. This is why Jefferson then starts measuring everything because, you know, if you could just prove everything is bigger, you know, our moose is bigger than the reindeer in, in, uh, in Sweden. But Humboldt does the same. So he comes big with, back with his portrait, and um, the Europeans kind of, first of all, realize, you know, it might be a quite magnificent um, continent, but it also, and that's what Bolivar says, it reminds the colonists themselves how beautiful their country is, their continent is. And that's why he says he awakens South America with his pen. And then Bolivar, interestingly, uses a lot of nature metaphors in his political speeches. So he talks a lot about volcanoes, for example. You know, yeah. The revolution is like a volcano <clears throat> about to erupt. Mm -hmm. um, he writes a poem about uh, climbing the Chimborazo. And he says, you know, I'm leaving behind, you know, basically he's leaving behind his footsteps and then, earlier French explorer, and he, you know, leaves his own footsteps in the snow. So he's, you know, he kind of surpasses them. But he uses the Chimborazo as a symbol for the mm -hmm. revolution, really. I wonder, you know, people may be, be curious about Humboldt's personal life, um, hearing so much about his, his influence and his intellect. And he was fascinating that way, too. Um, he, first of all, was a, was a great, uh, he was so attractive to women around the world. He broke lots of hearts, um, very sort of studly sex symbol in some ways. He was also almost certainly gay, yeah. um, and so never had a relationship um, with a woman, almost certainly had intense relationships with men that may or may not have been sexual, much whispered about at the time. Can you shed life on, on what he was like as a, as a person? Well, I think he was incredibly charismatic. Um, he was... Uh, Everybody talked about, the, you know, that he talked incredibly fast. He switched from one language to another language. He was charming, so women fell for him. But he is also, um, so I think he's a man of contradiction. He, I think he also liked being alone in nature. And I think one of the reasons, you know, was that he couldn't really live out his love for man at that time. And he has very intense relationship with kind of a few younger um, scientists. And even for the standard of the time of kind of very romantic, platonic um, relationships, I think, you know, it, they are very strong relationships. And there are, there are um, indications, there are letters where other people say, like, right, like, so-and-so is now Humboldt's new Adonis, or where a German um, poet, for example, writes about um, 
that a biography about Humboldt was good, but it didn't you know, talk about the sexual irregularities. His brother Wilhelm didn't like it when he arrived with male friends. So the male friends were not allowed to stay in his house, which are all indicators. But he's, he's, all, he's a very, also personally a very conflicted person, and he talks about how he escapes to nature, even as a little boy, how he did find nature soothing, how he, he says, like, nature um, calms the passion. So there is a sense also that he, you know, the, the physical exertions he goes through on these explorations are just unbelievable. I mean, when I follow his footsteps, for example, one of the volcanoes, he describes how he's lying on this, it's like a little balcony inside the crater, and, mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing is kind of shaking. And, you know, and I, I looked and I was like, no way I'm following his footsteps. <laughs> I'm like, madness, complete madness. So there is this bit where you think, like, how much is he actually pushing himself to, I don't know, go say, well, I might drop down here, I don't know. So but, I think he's a fascinating character. But that actually gets to, actually, the electric eel story, yes, which really is a good yeah. one. I mean, Humble, when he's in South America, he's being bitten by just about everything, nearly poisons himself with curare. He's kind of <coughs> trying out all kinds of salves and local um, concoctions to try to get the bugs to go away. Um, I mean, he really is, I think, having a hard time. But he also had been experimenting on himself with galvanization and electrical experiments in Germany, which would sometimes leave him a little debilitated when he's like... <laughs> 4,000 experiments. 4,000 experiments. I mean, it, you talk about measuring things, it gets a little compulsive. So he wants to, to be able to measure the electric eels that are in these pools in oh. South America, but the problem is how do you end up capturing them when they deliver a fatal vault until they discharge enough of that to actually be something that you can handle? Yeah, and then he gets, he gets um, 30 wild horses and they kind of charge into, into the pond and their churning hoofs then kind of the eels come up, they discharge their kind of 600 volts, and then they kind of take them out. After but, they're exhausted. But some, some of them are not quite exhausted. So they're doing all these, and they do these experiments where like, Bonplan holds one end, Humboldt the other hand, and then they hold hands, and then they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, or, you know, they touch it with metal, they touch it with a you know, bit of bamboo. It's just hilarious. I mean, it's just a wonder they managed to survive the whole thing. It's like, let's see what happens when we do this. So. Yeah, he, and he comes by. He comes. He was kind of sickly as a as a boy and as a young man, and mm -hmm. he comes back much stronger and fitter. Which you know, I mean, he is so physically so fit. I mean, so fit. Well, you if have to be yeah. if you're going to tromp up and down mountains like that. Your cardiovascular is going to come back better. Your leg muscles and your butt's going to look just yeah. fine. So <laughs> you know, that actually made perfect sense that he's been <laughs> climbing up and down there. I don't have a problem with that. Um, so um, I. There's so much to talk about with, with Humboldt, and um, maybe uh, we have time for one last sort of mini discussion here. And, you know, with, with historians, we, we often sort of try to resist the, this question of, well, if the founding fathers were alive today, what would they say about you know, gun control? Or, you know, what if Abe Lincoln had an iPhone or whatever? <laughs> you know, but with, with Humboldt, I think maybe he's one of the few figures for whom it is appropriate to, because he was thinking about um, the history of the world in a very cosmic sense, in a sweeping sense. Um, what he did really was about predicting these vast um, cycles of, of history and, and global mm -hmm. change. And so I wonder, um, and, he was, and looking for, for kind of eternal truths, lasting truths. So I wonder if maybe um, each of you could talk a little bit um, about what you think Humboldt's response um, to the world today would would be, and maybe Neil, starting with you, thinking about um, how Humboldt would respond to the intellectual world of today, since he was someone who broke down disciplines, as we've discussed. Yeah, well, it's interesting because uh, you, you're probably all familiar with that, uh, that game of saying, if, you know, the, the parlor game of if you would like to have dinner with one historical figure, who would it be? And I remember somebody telling me at one point, they said, I'd like to have dinner with Alexander von Humboldt. And I, th I thought back to all of the stupid answers that I had given <laughs> to that question before. And I said, of course, Humboldt would be my, my first choice, be precisely because how is it possible for one individual to uh, be so um, engaged in all of these different areas? And I think that 
uh, look, now I, I'm, I'm the director of a library that would have been uh, Humboldt's absolute fantasy to be able to, um, uh, to, to step into, which was founded right around the time that, uh, that uh, Humboldt um, died, in fact. And I think that one of the <clears throat> other fundamental things about, about Humboldt that, uh, in addition to reading uh, this book, um, I encourage all of you to read Alexander von Humboldt because it was that more than anything else, he was a narratively driven person. His prose is absolutely limpid and engaging and uh, economical and inspiring. It is why everybody who reads Humboldt gets bitten by the Humboldtian bug in some ways. And I think that what he would react to today is the increasing move away from uh, a narrative engagement with the world. Mm -hmm. That is that we learn about the world, we absorb the world through reading and then through writing, mm -hmm. through communicating in a way that only human beings are capable of doing on this planet. And I think that we, we, we as much as he was absolutely fascinated by technology and embraced every aspect of it, I think he would find the, that, that kind of fusion of technology and communication a puzzling one mm. for him because it would basically make it much more difficult for him to express himself, to demonstrate the depth of his knowledge um, in the way that he did throughout all of his, uh, his work. He, so he wouldn't have been tweeting from the slopes of Cotopaxi, probably. I don't think he could but, do 148 characters. I no, no. <laughs> but you know, one of the moments that, that, that struck me in your in your book, Andre, is when you say that a reason that he he left South America, and I guess it was 1804, was that he realized he'd been away for so long he didn't know what new scientific and technological discoveries there had been in the world in the last five years. Yeah, and he was wow. really, and he was he Imagine was really that. worried. And yeah. he said, like, I'm like, you know, it's like living on the moon. Basically. But in some ways, that's mm -hmm. that's liberating. You're not looking at your daily, you know, flooded inbox and seeing what's the latest blog, what's happening on this, you know, list serve or what have you. Um, you're out there unhooked, un unplugged. I, I mean, I, I think you put this so beautifully um, that, I mean, I think Humboldt would have enjoyed the internet for um, an email for just for the reason that he could just quickly fire off a question to someone. But I totally agree with you that he's, he's so curious and he, he liked layers. I mean, I didn't show that today, but when you look at his manuscripts, they're the most extraordinary things because he starts off with, you know, right, jotting down his ideas, and then he has a few more ideas, scribbles them in the corner, and then he runs out of space, and he writes bits on, you know, ideas on bits of paper, and he <coughs> glues them on top of each other. He pulls out an article, glues it on top. So you end up with this multi-layer collage of thoughts, and, and I think there is... He would lose that today, and because he goes so deep, and and also, and I think that's really super important is his style of writing. This kind of he comes up with, I think, the blueprint of all nature writing today, because he combines poetic landscape descriptions with scientific treatises. So, if you look at people um, who write today about nature, although they might have never heard of Humboldt, they are still very much mm -hmm. within his tradition. Um, so I, you know, I totally agree with you on this one. And I'll, I'll also ask you quickly, and then we'll finish um, with, with Eleanor, um, if it's possible to answer quickly, what would he think of um, the natural world and the relationship of humans with the natural world that uh, he saw around him today? I think he would be totally shocked. Um, so Humboldt wrote, I mean, in his, in his bleakest moments, he said, um, one day, humankind is going to travel to other planets, and we will take our avarice, our greed, or our destructive force, we will take that with us, and we are going to turn those planets as barren as we've already done with Earth. Mm -hmm. So I think he would be absolutely shocked that, you know, although you know, all these things were kind of known more than 200, year, 200 years ago, that we're still continuing <clears throat> down that path, and that with all the knowledge we now have, much more than he had, that we are still not engaging with this properly. And Eleanor, I wonder if you would um, wrap things up by um, telling us, and I think you might show us something as, as well, um, 
what you think Humboldt would think of the of the art and literature and culture of our time. I mean, the the good news in all of that, the silver lining, is that we are now in a um, a place where the younger generation of painters, in particular, um, and sculptors, um, have really started to engage with a lot of Humboldt's ideas. Um, and in fact, um, I've got one slide. Um, in order to, to sort of give you a, a synopsis of that, there are four artists in particular whose work, um, not only does their work engage with Humboldt, they've actually read their Humboldt, they understand what's going on. There's Mark Dion who did a cabinet of curiosities for the America Society that he titled Humboldt. There is Alexis Rockman who's really worried about GMOs and so you have um, square tomatoes to fit inside here. You've got chickens with extra wings and uh, larger breasts, you've got um, the Watson and Crick double helix that's taken apart. You have the cow that basically is uh, maximized for meat production at the expense of its anatomy. And when you have scary pictures like this compared to then pictures of sort of the rainforest that's been exploded into uh, outer space, this idea um, comes full circle. If you saw Life of Pi, there's a hallucinatory sequence with the tiger. Alexis Rockman actually designed that sequence um, as part of the art crew for that. You have Walton Ford, who only paints extinct animals life-size, which means when he does elephants, it's on 10 sheets of paper the size of the screen. Um, but he deals with the issue of natural imbalances um, and does it in a way that owes its soul back to Audubon and Catesby and a lot of the artist naturalists that came before him. And then James Prosek, who teaches in <coughs> Yale's forestry school, who wrote at age 19 um, a book on trout of the world because he was a trout fisherman and there wasn't one and so somebody had to do it. Um, and then went on to write about eels because he really didn't understand the whole Sargasso Sea piece of it. And then did a book on ocean fishes and did a large mural for our museum for an exhibition on birds called The Singing and the Silence about how birds are a bellwether for the health or uh, risk uh, going on in nature um, that also then sort of dovetailed with experiences in his own life. They are each in their own way remarkably thoughtful and remarkably verbal for visual artists in their eloquent understanding of what's at stake here. Um, they've read Rachel Carson, they've read Humboldt, they understand 19th century American art. And you know, quite frankly, they are the people that inspire the kinds of things you're doing here. You have Sandbox. It's the intersection of art, nature, and the environment. And I know that Alex Castro is working to try to get Mark Dion here um, to speak, and I would heartily encourage you to give him a standing room only welcome when he gets here because he is an incredibly thoughtful man about those relationships. Um, Alexis Rockman has spent years in Guyana um, painting himself in the rainforest there. James Prosek has done similar trips. Walton Ford has done the same thing. These are people who are not armchair travelers. They actually have not just read Humboldt. They've been inspired to go places to see things and to incorporate that firsthand experience in what they're doing. And I think that for all that we do live on a planet that we think of as being at risk, there is also the sense that we still hold the key to being able to make sure that the things that we care about, that our understanding of our world, that the downstream consequences of our actions are in fact things that we have some knowledge of rather than simply spooling out things that then go completely out of control. Um, so I'd like to think that if we could bring Humboldt to life at this point, that yes, um, he would be despairing of some things, exhilarated about others, it would pack in in about five hours in six different languages and we'd all be out of breath by the time it was over, but it would be a great <laughs> ride. Great, thank you so much to all of you. See, um, you came here thinking you didn't know anything about Humboldt. It turns out you've been living inside his brain your whole <laughs> life. You didn't even know it. So thank you for coming, and please join us for our next program.